Today on the Water Table Podcast, I'm interviewing Chuck Wingert of Wingert Land Services. Chuck has been in the industry for over 40 years, and we have a great conversation about land and managing land in today's environment. Well, welcome to the Water Table Podcast. Today I have with me Chuck Wingert um, from Wingert Land Services, and I'm really excited about the opportunity to talk with you today. I was going to say interview, but I think, Chuck, this is just going to be a conversation between you and I. Um, We've known each other a long time. I'm guessing more than 25 years, less than 30 probably, because I've only been in the industry for 28, but probably not long after that, that we got to know each other. And uh, like I told you before, um, before the podcast this morning, that you know, you're you're you are the right guest for the water table. If you could pick one guy, um, you would be in that top five of of uh, right guests to tell the story um, of the last several decades of what we dealt with in Minnesota and uh, kind of why is why is it interesting here and why are a lot of these things coming together here with our topography, our soils, um, you know, we deal with things that other parts of our country and world don't deal with. And we, we grow a, a lot of corn and soybeans. And, uh, but we do have some issues with water and, uh, and soils combined. So, you know, I just kind of want to talk about that with you. And first of all, thank you for being on the podcast. Um, but uh, it will be fun to have a conversation. And maybe let's just start by telling your history. Um, How did you get involved in and where I see you, whether you see yourself or not, I see you as kind of an expert in this whole water quality and agriculture um, arena because of your experiences. And you got a lot of them in land, in drainage, um, that all kind of converge on what we're going to talk about today. Well, everything in life is sort of an evolution. I actually went to a technical institute on uh, engineering and architecture. I worked with an architect in the cities, and uh, the architecture profession is depending on how the economy is doing. And we were in a down period after a while, and my cousin called from southern Minnesota and said, we really need some help down here at NRCS. And we know you know design, we know you know drawing and all that stuff. So I came down just for a short little bit to take a little break, and I haven't left yet. But, <laughs> uh, so I went back to Mankato State and uh, business management, and in that during that period started a drainage surveying business because I'd worked with NRCS, and uh, you can't do the work that contractors need from 8 to 5. So I'd work on it all, every night, and uh, they couldn't pay overtime. So it just made logical progression to start the surveying company. And as that evolved by the mid 80s, I was spending so much time with farmers that wanted us to look at the soils, look at outlets. What do they need to do for drainage to bring it to maximum production? What do they have to do for erosion control to get it in good shape? And so uh, b- this is before they would go to an auction or make an offer on a farm. So I finally got licensed in 85, and then we did both businesses from 85 till 2010, where I turned it over to one of my long-term staff, and and I just focused on real estate. But over that period, we probably we designed well over 70 million feet of drain tile across southern Minnesota, and the two businesses go to hand, hand in hand. The drainage is so important to farms in our area, and the real estate that uh, that background's been really valuable. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you know when and you look at my career in in this industry as you know, from the mid nineties and, uh, and as it's evolved and as drainage has, um, and subsurface drainage has become a thing in, you know, more central Minnesota, Western Minnesota, North Dakota, places like that, they realize the need and, and the opportunity they could farm without it. But when they get at the opportunity, they have to improve on water quality, to improve on yields, to improve on getting in, you know, yields by getting into the field earlier, you know, because it's because it's good to go from a planting standpoint, whereas they might have to wait a few weeks if they don't have that drainage. Um, but in your area, where you where you focused on early on in your career around that Mankato, Minnesota area, um, you really have to have drainage because it's more rainfall than it is in central or western Minnesota. And uh, you got a lot more topography you're dealing with, with like you told me this morning, 
I wasn't aware there's seven rivers that converge on Mankato there. So there's a lot going on. And um, way before your time, there was different types of drainage being done there. Um, so, so it's interesting how it evolves in people's minds being 100 miles away. Well, we're doing drainage to improve our yields in central Minnesota. In your part of Minnesota, they were doing drainage to improve their yields, but somewhat out of necessity also. Well, you get down by Mapleton, which is just south of Mankato, and that's what they call the lacustrian soils. It's where the, the glacier ground to a halt. It's powder fine, ultra, ultra heavy. And uh, your optimum spacing down there is every 33 feet. And there's a lot of farmers now going, what we did back in the 70s and early 80s at 100 feet, you could barely afford to go 100 foot spacings. Mm -hmm. And even once, that's before we had drainage guides, design charts, soil books. Once we got those, we knew that we needed to be narrower, but economics didn't allow it. So over the time, it started 100, then down to 80s, 70s. Now there's a lot of people doing taking two strings in between the hundreds we did back in the 70s, or if they're starting from scratch, there's more people going every 25 feet because it's ultra heavy. Mm -hmm. As you get out of the Mapleton area into Mankato and as you move out, that's the glacial till where it's still very heavy, but it's not that ultra, ultra heavy stuff. Mm -hmm in the Bufords, Barbets, and Lura soils that uh, without good drainage is pancake flat so that when it rains the only way it's going anywhere is through the ground and into the drainage system. So it's uh, it definitely needed down there or you're in the wrong business. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know when you you use the words pancake flat it, it kind of triggered a thought with me. It's also some of those areas almost the, the, the soil is almost like pancake um, it's so powdery that when you pour water on it, if you don't have the right drainage, it just sits there, right? Yeah, it does. And even you know, even with really good drainage, when you get some of those years where it's just nonstop rain, it just those those areas suffer. Where you get out into the glacial till where there's a little more slope to it, those actually will do better. But that's uh, it's it's just a characteristic of the Mapleton area that it's it's the heaviest we have in the state in in one spot. There's a lot of areas that have a little barbet or a little lura, a okaboji, but mm -hmm. here that's all it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting because uh, you know I didn't plan on talking about this, but the there still is a lot for us to learn in our industry about what are the optimum spacings in because I think too many people just kind of go with what is being done now in that area you're talking about something specific but you know even up in this canyon high county area or in north dakota you go and kind of if you're in north dakota right now you know it's 40 foot spacing or 60 foot spacing as well they're talking about from you know one area of north dakota you could go 200 miles and they're doing the same thing and it might not it might not be what's appropriate it's just kind of what's being done because they see other people doing that rather than really studying and there are contractors that are doing that studying and that are giving those kind of advice but i i just think there's more for us on the water table even to discover there and to talk about um with right people as we go so that's more of a comment than than anything but uh and you've been involved in that for you know four decades now so well and the one thing i'm seeing right now is everybody there's a move to really narrow up spacings well that increases your coefficient but then they aren't upsizing their submains. They aren't upsizing their mains. You've got to have a holistic plan, not just, okay, I'm going to do my farm at 25 foot spacings. Well, that's fine, but if you don't have the outlets to take care of that, in dry conditions when it can drain out, you'll be fine. But in the wet conditions when you really need it, you don't have the outlet to get rid of the water in the time frame that you need it. Yeah, that, that absolutely. We've talked about that on the podcast on proper sizing of outlets. We've talked about drainage coefficient, but it is absolutely something that, and you can go across the Midwest, that we are going to have to address if we want to optimize yields and, and really um, water quality too, because when you get that soil profile full, what happens? You right. start having erosion and, and different things. So um, it is absolutely, and I think you know some of our some of our government agencies or um, adversaries in in uh, environmentalists who maybe don't understand some of that well why would you want to upside and let's not 
let's you know fight against upsizing mains but in reality it's part of the whole system that can create better water quality and less erosion well and you've seen skaggs research and some of these others that the best erosion control that you can install in your farm is system tiling mm -hmm. because once you get that water out of there the soil is more of a cohesive unit it stays together where once it's oversaturated it just goes and you know about the sponge effect which the environmentalists that i've worked with don't want to hear it mm -hmm. but we can now turn all this ground into a gigantic sponge and that's why the research has shown with the advent of system tiling the frequency of flooding has actually been reduced the problem is now we just get big rains and we had a 14 incher a couple years ago we've had a uh, five and two days earlier this spring, I think nine inches in May. And uh, so we've been getting these frequency of big rains. So uh, even a good trial system, I always kid once you, once you get a system tiled, we get a two inch rain on Monday, you won't even notice it. We get a two inch rain on Wednesday, you might have a little ponding. It's the two inch rain on Friday that it's hard to design for. We <clears throat> just don't have the economics design at a two and three inch coefficient, which a lot of the cities are designing at two and four inch coefficients. It's gone in two seconds because there's no absorption in right. uh, concrete. There's no absorption in roof, uh, ceilings and roofs. But the farms, you know, we've got gigantic sponges that we can create to minimize these floods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and just to explain that a little bit, you know, we... It, this is obviously it's different in different soils, but as a rule, um, if your if your tile lines are four feet in the ground, and you have four feet of soil, there is air in that soil. There's mm -hmm. soil and there's water, right? And so, and in the soil's about fifty percent, and the air is about twenty five percent, and the water's about twenty five percent. So, you know, as a as a rule, now it's not in every soil. It's not the same, but it's about a foot of water you can store in that four foot of soil profile so you start thinking about that if you can pull that water out of the soil at, to get it to be the optimum and then you get that two inch rain that first two inches is now being stored right. in that foot of um of profile and then if you get two more inches right away like you say you're going to have a little bit of ponding and then but if that can wait a week in between those it's just going to continue to store that water in the soil profile and that's where you start to see positive water quality attributes that's where you start to see um, your crops being you know your your uh, root system not being too wet and being able to grow deeper and right. creating a healthier crop so um, there's a ton of benefits that if you aren't willing to research it or, or don't aren't around the the industry, you just wouldn't understand, and under, understandably wouldn't understand. There's no reason to know that, but it's really healthy for our environment. Oh, absolutely. We can absorb the chemicals and fertilizers that much more when there's air pockets in the in this ground. So it's a. Uh, it's, it's way, very much misunderstood, and I've I've had to speak in front of some of these groups where. They flat out told me ahead of time that you're going to be the T-bone steak that we're going to dangle in front of all these hungry Dobermans. <laughs> and so I brought tables of documentation for university research, and there was, I think, like 90 different uh, governmental groups there. And there's a number of people that came up and said, we appreciate it. We never knew, heard the other side. And the rest of them didn't want to take any information. We've already made up our mind, and we don't want to hear it. Yeah. And yeah. that's that's what yeah. we're up against. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Knowledge so, is king if, if somebody will listen. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And I think it's our responsibility in the knowledge we have to just keep putting it in front of people and maybe – Maybe our, we have to learn at different times our approach can be different or whatever, but uh, if we keep putting the right things in front of people, um, hopefully, not everybody, but hopefully um, you'll continue to get people to say, huh, I didn't think of it that way, um, or we can do things. Because I think our industry is showing, too, over the last, my time in here of almost 30 years now, that we're, we're uh, adaptable, too. At times... Um, like anything, that can be a challenge, right? People don't like to change. Humans don't like to change. But uh, I think our industry is doing things differently. Um, absolutely. That, that absolutely is um, creating a better environment for all society, not just farmers, whether it's drainage water management, um, you know, some of our buffer strip initiatives and bioreactors. And we've done a ton of talking about that 
on the podcast, but it's exciting to, to see where this is going. And I know, you know, you have, uh, you're dealing with some things currently, um, uh, around where you're on a, on a committee or you're going to, you're involved with some stuff with the Minnesota river and, uh, talk a little bit about that and where you see that going and, well, we'll see. There's there's a big move, of course. There's some positives and there's some negatives, as always. The positives is we've seen some changes in NRCS that some of these things that, you know, early on, the environmentalists back in the 80s said, if we listen to you, we're going to lose 50% of the wetlands in the state. And I said, you're absolutely right, because we included 80% of the land that's got a 100-year cropping history should have never been called a wetland in the first place. But we have seen some changes that some of these are just letting go that, you know, we shouldn't have called them wetlands. On the other hand, we're seeing more uh, push to have every drainage system, county and judicial, have a big retention pond. The well, question is, who does that, who pays for that? If it's a public benefit, is it right now it just all falls right? We're going to mandate the farmers have to buy this guy's farm to turn it into a big retention pond, and you're going to pay for it or we aren't going to let you do anything. Well, if it's a re, if it's that big of a benefit to the public, is it really the resp- responsibility of the farmers and potentially break the farmers trying to pay for that? So uh, again, there's positives and negatives, but you know, as we talked ahead of the program, dealing with I've been I was the national the national president of the land improvement contractors. That's farmer f- farms, ranches. Uh, timberland, recreation, transitional land, and a lot of the brokers that are good friends that I work with out in Colorado and Texas and Nebraska always kid me that you and your heavy clay soils, uh, you system tile them, but you still don't know exactly what you're going to get every year. We're out here with our irrigation. We know we're going to get 220 to 250 bushel of corn a year. And I said, that's true, but you've had to change everything because you couldn't blow it up in the air anymore. It's all switched to uh, drip irrigation because you don't use as much water. And even with that, your aquifers, the Ogallala you've read about, dropping dramatically. And all these aquifers are dropping where some of them have had to go back to dry land because they just can't keep going deeper. So I keep telling them, that's fine and you're right, but... To be in an area of the United States that getting rid of our unusable rainfall is our problem. Some of the, we were, had a client that wanted a ranch, so we were out there meeting with them. And in the night, we'd sit down and talk a little bit about what's going on. They said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I do drainage engineering. And uh, they said, what do you mean? I said, well, we go into a farm with our heavy clays, and we'll go anywhere from every 30 to 80 feet apart to take the unusable water out of the soil. And they go, well, what do you, where does it go? So it goes into collector lines, then it goes into streams and down to rivers. You just let it go away? Right. And they literally said, how do we get it? Yeah. If you're going to just throw it away, how do we get it? Well, that's what people forget. We're in such a fortunate part of the United States that we've got 360 million contiguous acres within one country with the best river system in the whole world that you don't have to go through four or five states to get or countries to get your product out that we're, we're so fortunate, but we forget about those kind of things and uh, just try to look, turn it into a negative rather than the ma- major positive it is. Mm-hmm. And, and how do we continue? You know, I think that's, that's a real opportunity for us is how do we continue to take what we've been blessed with and make it better rather than start to talk about how can we regulate that or how can we you know, slow it down. Let's let's look at opportunities for um, cleaning up that water even more, which we've done with some of these very very economically. When you think about uh, water quality in in cities and how they have to treat water to get it to um, to have less phosphorus nitrate, whatever it might be in it, um, whereas we can just run it through a buffer strip, and we're seeing. We're seeing just tremendous um, changes in that water from one end to the other, you know, up to 90% reduction in, in nitrate with uh, with bio bioreactors, and I can't remember what it is, but 40 or 50% with just a a uh, controlled drainage system. So not every field, when you talk about 360 million acres, works for that. But if we look at the ones that do and say, let's just do more of this. Mains, we talked about that, you know, increasing our 
our ability to to redo our our mains and to uh, to have larger mains so we can store more water. All of that's going to make a big difference. And I think our um, we have to find a way to partner with our adversity adversaries in regards to let's let's not be adversaries. Let's look at how we can do this together. That creates a win-win for everybody. And I think, you know, that's one reason why I wanted you on the podcast is you're willing, if you didn't know this, you're willing to share your opinion in life. And uh, I've always appreciated that about you. But but also when you take someone willing to share their opinion that also has the knowledge, um, which you do, um, how do we combine that with then making a difference in the world and um, in the world that we can make a difference in? Well, that's one thing people forget. You, you know, you watch TV sometimes, and when they're interviewing a farmer at the state capitol, they got the guy with the bib overall that's got manure on it, and it's like that's the farthest thing from reality. Farmers are one of the industries that are the quickest to change. If I can find some tillage that can do a better job and leave more residue on the surface, uh, if I can do something to reduce erosion, farmers are so quick to change. I'd say probably quicker than almost any other industry. You see the turnover in machinery that can do things better at such a rapid pace. And they're all for, they're the ultimate environmentalists because they live here. We're not trying to contaminate the soils that they live in and where they uh, raise their kids and their water. They're just the opposite. And they're very conscious about making sure the farm is in a better position than it when they leave it to their kids. So uh, they're not opposed to drain, uh, looking at alternatives at all, but we still have to try to deal with the economics of doing that because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's not a cheap sport. Yes, yes, and 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 I agree. And now you know I want to step back a little bit too. And you're talking about um, water quality and and retention, and you know there there was this idea, and, and we were talking about uh, storing water in the soil profile, and there was this idea up in North Dakota. 20 plus years ago when they're having a lot of their year after year spring floodings and how do we how do we manage water and you know now they've finally gotten to where they're currently building the Fargo diversion which uh, was a a big political football for a while and now they're spending almost four billion dollars to build the diversion when in fact there was a plan they called it the waffle plan where you would take you know sections of land and push the water into that area and let it sit just like when you pour syrup on a waffle, literally, and you know how it, it sits in the in the uh, squares, and uh, and what you know that would that would have worked. But the same the same concept is if you would have said we're going to have an initiative to tile. I'm just throwing out numbers, but 50 million acres from from South Dakota up into you know from um, the border of South Dakota up to Fargo by tiling that land and allowing that land to hold the water so instead of it being above ground it would have been stored but it would have been stored below ground um, probably would have been able to do the same have the same effect as what the Fargo diversion is going to have for you know a third or a quarter of the money that they're going to spend doing that and you know that's water under the bridge so to speak because they're doing that but these are the things that we need to continue to talk about so that everybody understands what we can do and the benefits that are involved in that. Well, and I've been doing a bunch of projects with the fish and wildlife people recently, and one of the things I look at is they're concerned about the migratory birds and places that they have big areas that they can land on the way up, and uh, with controlled drainage, we could do a lot of things. Now, like you said, not every farm's conducive to it, but we can shut it off, let water get on the landscape over the winter and the spring when the migratory birds are coming up. You've got all these places to land, feed, and before planting, you can pull the, pull the dams and let them drain out, raise a good crop, and it could work out very well. Again, not every farm is conducive to that, but there's a lot of areas that are. Mapleton's not really, a, we looked at it for decades ago, uh, but it's so heavy. It's hard to do that, but some of these lighter soils are very conducive. Big peat areas are very conducive to that. We could back that water up, have really good places for water storage and migratory birds, 
drain it out when we were ready to plant. That water moves through peat so easily, we can accomplish both. But it's just educating uh, landowners and uh, agencies that uh, this could be a real positive. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, when you start talking about, and I'm all for that and really excited about because I enjoy the outdoors, I enjoy doing those kind of things with hunting and fishing. But when you start talking about um, manipulating the land that way and needing the landowner to be involved with, um, opening and closing gates and, and, you know, flooding and then, and, or allowing the water to be on the field and then, and then getting a dry enough time to plant. We can't just expect people to do that, that own the land, um, and take all their time to do that without being compensated somehow to do that. And that's, that's just another piece of this on how do, how do we connect the general public and what the general public's needs are with private property and private landowners. And I think that's gonna be something that'll be evolving for a long, long time that there's just gonna be that tension there and can we find a happy medium? Well, I, there's a lot of farmers that would do it. Uh, not to be negative, but one of the problems I've always found with controlled drainage is the contractors. We want to get in there, put our main in, and ram those laterals in. We don't want to take any time to think, and we don't want to take time to design and contour, design those things. So it's going to take some education and probably, like you said, some extra money or uh, somebody that designing these and said, okay, you don't have to think about it. We'll take care of it ahead of time. Here's the plan. Go install it. Because uh, that, that's been what I see as the holdup to what could be a very strong positive do you think do you think that's that's coming now with uh, that there's other um, I don't know if you want to say agencies or companies that are are building the capabilities to be able to do some of that design work and that are that are out there and open to that or I'd like to think so if we you know uh, the problem is if you get the big engineering companies involved it's it's so expensive yes, yes. that it takes out some right away puts you behind the eight ball before you even start right uh, but right now rather than just saying okay we're going to make you install these retention ponds let's look at the whole picture like you're saying and not just say okay here's a stop gap but we could be doing something within the soils that would be more productive than just saying okay we're going to run it into a pond and as you see in town uh any housing development has to have a big retention pond. Well, we take a lot of ground out of production uh, that could put houses on. Mm -hmm. And is it really, in the low flows, it'll work. But when we have the rains, it's, it's really, they, they really aren't that effective. Mm -hmm. uh, and they only, the so ones I've seen, some of my staff, uh, only slows it up for a day. Mm -hmm. And that drains out real fast. So that's really not in my mind the solution i think looking at a more of a holistic approach and saying what can we do within the soils uh, rather than just say let's build a pond to dump it into right. it's probably going to be more cost effective and more beneficial drop more sediments all those kind of things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how uh how involved have you been in your career with working with watersheds and what's your experience well i've done enough of it you know we had in just the Blue Earth County, I think we had close to 90 drainage systems, county drainage systems put in from 1898 or 1889 till about 1930 when the wheels fell off at the Depression. And uh, the, very under-designed. There's some other design at a 1 16th inch coefficient. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened? Well, I think they looked at it with the farmers and said, here's what you need <clears> to do. And they all passed out cold and said, we have to do something when we aren't doing that. So it, to make it equal, they just lowered the coefficient. Where now a lot of them are trying to do at least a half inch or a one inch coefficient, yeah. and trying to get those upgraded is is very important. You know, they because uh, we've had some systems that were just done now that were six one thousand six hundred and fifty dollars an acre was your assessment, and that's probably equivalent to what it was back in the early nineteen hundreds. It broke a lot of people. It straightened the farms out forever, but it financially destroyed people. In, but we're at that point now where a lot of these systems are over 100 years old and they need to be brought into this century. But we have a lot of pressures to stop that from happening at all. So, uh, And we've done a couple of things with uh, Rinky Noonan where uh, we have all this upland 
Now we have, when you have an under-designed system, you get what I call the uh, designated holding pond. The poor guy that was in the low gets flooded out and oh, we don't really want to help you, it's working fine for us. So we said, okay, let's do that. Have the system buy your ground and we'll turn it into the retention pond. So rather than upsizing our mains and doing all these other things, let's just turn that into a big wetland, use the existing outlet as your overflow and let everything else come down into it. It's gonna clean the water, it's gonna drop any sediments or fertilizers, and this guy doesn't have to spend a fortune to fix it up. So I think there's a lot of things that can be done within existing systems, and they're starting to happen and, uh, as a way to solve it environmentally and drainage-wise. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't planning on uh, going this direction, but I kinda want to, so I'm going to. Um, if you look back, you've been to so many meetings, I've been to so many meetings where we talk about what the landscape looked like 100 plus years ago, um, you know, say in the early 1900s and all the wetlands that we've lost. And those wetlands, let's just be clear, were um, the government encouraged farmers to drain those wetlands before, before 1985. And we did a lot of that and we created some incredibly good productive land in doing so. Um, but since then, since Swamp Busters, December 23, 1985, is when you and I have been to a, to a lot of meetings and they'll, they'll throw up slides and they'll show you this is what it looked like, this is what it looks like now. And, and really with the whole characteristic or the whole ideas, we need to find a way to get back to some form of what it was. And, and what do you think 100 years from now this is, you know, your opinion, of course. But what do you think people will look at? Because when I when I start um, thinking about that, I'm really proud of what I've seen over the last 30, 40 years. You know, if you go from Swamp Busters to today um, on things like you just talked about, there is there is a lot of um, areas where we said, you know, we should just make this into a, a retention pond. They bought the land. You know, there's, we could go into example over example of that. There's um, projects, CREP, the CREP program, there's, you know, CRP that, that have done this. And some of that isn't permanent, of course, in the right. CRP, but it still is there. And, um, you know, I was out in, out just last night looking at a project and, and the water that was coming through the, the main there in the outlet, it was, you know, it was awesome. It just looks like I could go for a swim in it, and I was, and I was proud of that. And so the, the question, really long, long question, but really, is where do you think our society will be at when right now they look back because they're, they're looking at what it looked like a hundred years ago. What do you think they'll look at a hundred years from now and say, have we improved? Well, when you look at what was done in the turn of the century and. Uh the late early 1900s I hope that people look at what we do today that we're only as under designed as they were were from then mm -hmm. but there there's a one thing people forget with, with rim crep WRPs all those things we retired well over a quarter million of acres in the Minnesota River Basin alone mm -hmm. and uh, but they forget about that they say it's getting worse well if it's getting worse and we've done this has that been effective or do we need to change things? So I hope for the future that we see things get uh, more education, but unfortunately we become a soundbite society. We don't want to dig in anything. We want the answer in 10 words or less. And uh, so it's going to be hard to educate people to uh, s help us make the changes that farmers are willing to do, but right now we economically can't do that. Uh, so we'll see where it goes, but there's a lot of positives out there, and uh, we're always going to need food. And as, as the world gets bigger, we need to. The farmers, well, I, was, I was on a group that was supposed to look at it years ago. We're supposed to double or triple our production yeah. by 2050, yet we're not supposed to use drainage, we're not we're supposed to use chemicals, and by God forbid you use fertilizer. Yeah. Well, how are we supposed to do that? Yeah. Yeah. So we have to have a holistic approach on what's going to happen. Yeah, and I and you know I've said this many times, and um, you know I heard this uh, 
you know, how I'm going to articulate this. I heard this from a mutual friend of ours, Charlie Schaefer from Agridrain, but mm-hmm. um, just around when you look at a farm dollar and what happens to, to a dollar that's made on the farm is, you know, it, it, when you make a dollar on your farm and you'd made that dollar because of a drainage system. So you maybe would have made 50 cents, but now you're improving your yield and you're making a dollar instead. What happens to that? That dollar goes through the entire community, right? And, and it creates a tax base which pays for, you know, school levies, which builds churches and hospitals in these rural communities. And what we do is just so uh, rewarding to those of us in this industry because we're not building, we're not manufacturing a toy that's given to a seven-year-old at Christmas and he's done using it by the time he's eight and it's broke by the time he's 10 and thrown in the garbage. What we're doing is we're installing now, a drain tile that is managing the water on a farm, creating more yield, which is creating more money, putting more money in people's po- pockets year after year after year for generations. generations. And, uh, and that is where it gets pretty exciting because we're building a tax base for all of rural America. And um, that's where I hope we can connect the dots with those that may be our adversaries today. And I think that's what connects and why I want to bring it up a little bit. Uh, not that I want to talk to you much about this, but land values and the land values of land and then the land values of land that has um, proper water management on it and uh, how you see that just in your career and the difference that it makes. Well, I was having fun. I had my grandson with me the other day, and there's a young guy that I sold a farm to. And I said, gorgeous farm, but you got to get out there and tile it. Because his dad has never been a big tiler at all. You know, you just farm what you have. And they've got a farm here, and a quarter mile down the road, they have another one. Well, the son, after he bought it, system tiled it. And I showed my grandson, here's the one that dad has that's not tiled. Corn was all stunted. There's areas that were, obviously, the seed didn't germinate. And the field just looked like not good quarter mile away there's sons beautiful crop beautiful crop and you know just the the work i've done when you start taking it by dividing it by the so many feet per acre and times so many uh, dollars per bushel brings in mega millions of dollars into those communities those farmers every single year and it's like you said, you feel pretty good because it's made a dramatic difference in the lives of those farmers and the profitability. Being in business for 48 years, I can tell you there's a huge difference between the guys that said, you know, when I first started, it, guys would call me up, we wanted to do some tiling. And they'd literally look at the ground, I can only do 2,000 feet. Great, let's look at where you're going to benefit the most. So we do that. And they did that for 34 years. Then they were up to 5,000 feet per year. Then they were 10,000 over time. Now they buy a farm and system tile it. You've got to have the economics to move ahead, yeah. where the guys that are always going to tile have never moved ahead at all. Yeah. Yeah. They're still talking about it 40 years later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's a good time to share with you. I don't know if you've heard this, but another mutual friend of ours, Roger Ellingson, has a, good a saying that... Uh, if you love yourself, buy a house in Florida. If you love your kids, buy land. And if you love your grandkids, buy land and tile it. And uh, that's really what you're <laughs> saying Roger, right there. Yeah. Is, is, uh, it just improves things for the generations to come. Um, and you get the benefit of it, too. So it's it's pretty great that way. Um, it's been fun talking to you. What else you want to share with me I'd today? I'd say well, just one thing. You know, you talked about where things were and where we are. I sold a farm to a gal, and uh, we got talking, and she said, you know, would you dad like my dad's Ph.D. thesis he did in 1954 on drainage? But <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Very in-depth. It's wonderful. I should see if she'd let me release that to you, because if you see Blue Earth County, there wasn't a straight road in the whole county. Yeah. You went between. Yeah, around all the All the things. Yep. The tax base was terrible as more drainage came in. It improved, you know, one of my arguments for years was, why is it so so shallow? 
well, number one, they were doing it by hand. But two, I, my philosophy was they only went so deep because they were going from here to there to get the water off it so that they could have better pasture. He pointed that out exactly. But then as they saw the benefits, now they started putting a couple next to each other, turning their field square. The road straightened out. The tax base has changed dramatically, dramatically. You take drainage out of any county in southern Minnesota, in Minnesota period, you wouldn't have any tax base at all. Is it, it really made a dramatic difference from where we were once drainage came in, the economics of a county, the farmability of the land, the roads being straight. There, there was, there's just really was no negatives to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it, it, when you say that, it it reminds me of a comment that was made that was a real lightning rod comment, and that was, and and for and rightfully so, if it isn't explained more, but is you know some of these half acre wetlands and things like that are just worthless what what do they do and you know there is benefit to every wetland of course with water quality with um, things I wouldn't understand around um, you know whether it's insects or or ducks or different things that use it but I think what what needs to be asked in that is if you if um managing the water on that wetland that small nuisance wetland i'll call it which maybe is offensive to some people too but um managing the water and being able to farm through it what are the benefits of that so you're only looking at the benefit you know we have to keep it this way because there's benefits to having the small wetland but if you move that wetland to a different part of the field or you um have a three acre wetland here and six quarter acre wetlands over here and you move that all to one five acre wetland what are the benefits of doing that and there are benefits of that too from the standpoint of farmability of raising more crops of um, building a road straight whatever it might be there's lots of different benefits and i think we forget about that well and i just one of my farms i created a 13 acre wetland on and one of the fish and wildlife guys i was working said chuck that's a waste of time and i said why is that and I put a donut in there so you could have ducks. And he said, because they have the babies, then the predators eat them walking to somewhere where they can get to water. Mm-hmm. He said, you need, they want to see 1,000-acre tracks where they can spread out. You have good nesting, uplands, wetlands. He said, these little ones, yeah, there's water quality and uh, there's uh, benefits to it, but wildlife is not it, mm-hmm. especially ducks. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was a little bit of a wake-up call for me that you think you're doing a good thing yeah, and you're finding yeah. out I'm just feeding the predators. <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> right. Yeah, and I, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting when you think of that because I think we all personally think that way. What can I do? And we do small things like that, and sometimes it doesn't have any benefit. And so I, that's where I think that's why this podcast is good. That's why, you know, your willingness to come – up here and chat about this is good because people want to do good and sometimes they do that on their own and they're not making much of an impact whereas if we can do the research if we can ask questions of people that have experienced things before um, it can help us get to the right place faster so thanks for being here on that no i appreciate the time so it's always good to talk about drainage so it's one of my soft spots so well right you know I, I i know that i uh I've I've had the opportunity to have my wife on the podcast talk about land, and I need to get her her brother on there, and you you uh, work with them some, and, and uh, but they don't have the uh, the knowledge and history you do on drainage, and that's really what I wanted to talk about was was water quality on the farm and and why it makes a difference. So um, I think it's you know, I just want to state that on here too, that uh, our industry is, has really benefited from having you and your voice um, involved for the last 40 years as you've been such an advocate. And on behalf of the industry, I want to I want to thank you for that and thank you for being part of the podcast. Well, and that works both ways because I always appreciated your efforts and Kent's and uh, Prinsco's that when something was going on that's going to be negative to the farmers that are uh, like our wetland well-intentioned law Mm -hmm. 
written by people that don't understand what it was or have any boots on the ground to know what's going on. But I've always appreciated your efforts, and we've been to Washington together and the Capitol together, and uh, to stand up for the farmers and stand up for the industry. Not all the other companies are willing to do that. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. It's not just that. about money. It's about yep. you're making a yeah. living and yeah. protecting the farmers yeah. and being active when there's something that needs to be done. Yeah, yeah, and I think you and I grew up with the same um, – parenting where when when you you know when there's something that needs to be said say it and when you know what's there is a difference between right and wrong and make sure you that you're vocal on on what's right and uh and i think we're we're not i don't think we're losing that in society but what we are losing is just the knowledge of the of the farm and agriculture because there's so many less people when you grew up you know there was um many more people that grew up on a farm than there are today and i've I've mentioned that before too where um growing up rural minnesota graduated high school with 33 kids and and just a quick memory and count you know a third probably of them grew up on the farm you know and i asked my kids the same thing a few years ago how many kids do you know in your school and they went to high school with many more a couple hundred 250 i think and and it was, you know, one hand um, yeah. that, that they could count that they were friends with or that had a knowledge. So if they didn't have the knowledge of the farm from the fact that uh, my wife's parents still live on the farm, still farm, or the little bit that I get involved in it with my work and my wife with her work, they wouldn't have any knowledge of it. And that's where most of society is today. So we have a responsibility that I think – as, as the farm community and those, those of us that are connected to agriculture one way or not, that we forget about too, that um, we just think, well, you should know that. And the reality is, well, how? How would they know that if they're not? Well, there's so many less it. farmers. We lost right. so many young farmers back in the 80s yep. that went to town and never came back. And uh, one investor I was working with, a farmer was telling him that, you know, they aren't making any more farmland. And he said, that's not the problem problem is they aren't making any more young farmers Mm -hmm. so every young farmer we can get our hands on and keep on the farm is uh extremely important for the future and the knowledge base that goes with it yep yep for sure thanks for joining me today chuck always good (laughs) yeah thank you